हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन सत्याकाल सो आई एम वरुण साइंटिस्ट एट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ विस्कॉन्सिन in madison in usa and i've been part of cms for last 11 years and i will be your guide you know taking you through lhc cms in a virtual tour for next one hour feel free to ask as many questions you have you know we will try to answer those your queries your concerns your naive questions and welcome to the cms welcome you know cms virtual tour so so i don't know if someone wants to say something before we start otherwise we will go ahead uh, hi varun uh, you hi. can start okay <laughs> so okay so welcome again everyone so we are at this assembly hall where you can see you know do you guys know what is lhc lhc is large hadron collider which you see right now in in your screens okay this is 27 km on the border of swiss and france on the swiss and france that you see this circular collider okay So this 27 kilometers is between the Jura Mountains, which is on the back side side, which you see this green region, and then on the other side is Mount Saleh. And what you see here in white color is Mont Blanc, the highest peak of the Alps, which is on the border of Swiss and France and Italy. And this is the 27 kilometer LHC tunnel, the Large Hadron Collider. We call it large because it's 27 kilometers. hadrons i guess you guys you probably know if you do not know it's uh, the the composite states of quarks so quarks are the fundamental particles which do not exist in free states uh, they always come in pairs or triplets and form this composite states which we call hadrons and collider because we smash them so and why we smash them because we want to understand our nature how we all came into existence how we interact and you know some all the answers that we do not have about nature we try to address them so there are many ways you know we can address these questions uh, like if you look at the big heavenly bodies in astronomical objects what that's done in astronomical observatories where you look at different big planets but here at lhc we try to look at the smallest possible things the minuscule thing so how you can look at small objects you try to collide them right you break them like at at your home you have anything you want to look inside the easiest way is to break them so that's what we are trying to do break the particles to the smallest possible scale we can and how can we uh, break anything we smash them as hard as possible so that's what is being done here so if i ask uh, uh, my colleagues to if we can play this short video and we can probably uh, move the camera towards this other screen i will go there and try to show you how you know lhc naively work so if you can try to look uh, on the screen i guess we are sharing the right camera now and uh, you can see the screen so i'll going to press the button okay and if you see here these are the protons that are starting their journey so in the accelerators right now the protons you can see accelerating in super proton synchrotron which is a circular 7 km accelerator once they reach about 450 gv they start moving into the bigger large hadron accelerator lhc accelerator which is 27 km you see they are circulating right now and when they circulate they need to reach the desired energy right now we are accelerating them to about 6.8 uh, tera electron volt and what you now see in front of your screens is the collisions that happen at four different points uh, where we have put big detectors at the top is cms for which you are having the virtual tour tour today okay so we have three more other detectors atlas lhcb and ls okay 
So now I also have my colleague, Professor Ashok. Uh, he will probably talk something about himself. Hello. Uh, good morning to all. Although on my screen, I cannot see you, but I hope you can see me very well. Uh, oh, yeah. Camera is in front of me. Thank you. So uh, my name is uh, Ashok Kumar. Uh, I am uh, uh, presently working as a associate professor at Delhi University. Uh, I belong to uh, Himachal Pradesh, just to give you a glimpse of uh, interaction. And then uh, my uh, main education masters and uh, PhD was from Punjab University, just uh, nearby to you students. Uh, so these days I'm working for, uh, for the upgrade of the CMS experiment, the experiment which you, which you, uh, see today through the virtual visit was, uh, was, you know, idolized, uh, uh late nineties and then in from 1992 to 1997, 98, 99, things happen for conceptual design report and so on. And then after. Uh, the construction, you know, the detail construction plan was, uh, uh, had happened actually. You know, CMS uh, is a very, very unique point because uh, we use the tunnel from large electron positron uh, uh, collider, but CMS point was not extravated earlier. So we had to do a lot of stuff here. Okay, I can see the students. Thank you. So uh, uh, the point is that uh, the the final construction, the hall which we are standing right now, uh, you know, the, this is the surface where, you know, uh, many components of the CMS were assembled on the surface. And then it went down a uh, hundred meter uh, into the tunnel. And right now, you know, you can see the big experiment, which is 50 meter long and, you know, a 22 meter, a 29 meter long actually, with a few more components and 15 meter in diameter, having, you know, 37 kiloton weight or something, having a 3.8 Tesla magnetic field. So, you know, uh, this is a technology which was, you know, finally came into existence for having the, the glimpse of actual proton-proton physics in 2009. Uh, we started a little earlier, a year before, for having various commissioning exercises, but then, you know, in 2009, the the collision started but anyway the point is that today you are going to have a glimpse of different uh, um, uh, different facilities which we, we, we which we use uh, for the for sporting the the experiment which is sitting inside the tunnel and also uh, the technologies you will also uh, see which 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 actually support the running of the experiment uh, this experiment also has some, some ingredients which were built within India. Uh, I will show you some part if we can start focusing on the, on the back, where I will focus you uh, on, on complete picture of the CMS and also, uh, the parts which were, uh, which were fabricated, uh, in India. So I will go from the center, uh, the pixel, uh, the, the pixel and the, and the tracker. So I would say that when we talk about the big magnetic field, you know, the big magnetic field means you are trying to make the, the tracks of the particles. Okay. So to make the tracks of the particle, uh, you have to have a big magnetic field. And if you remember the Lorentz field equation, you can, you can see that, uh, B, if I ignore the cross term and take the maximal effect, it is charge actually charge into, you know, V cross B is equal to uh, the force, but that force is equivalent to the centripetal force, which is MB square by R. So you can, if you play it a little bit, your momentum, which is B, which we are going to measure through these tracks uh, is coming from the effect of the magnetic field and as well as the curvature, which is happening here. So how to get that curvature? So you have, a different layers of the of the of the silicon sensors now why we are using silicon sensors silicon sensors are, are coming from the semiconductor physics S semiconductor physics okay so uh, in the semiconductor 
physics you have uh, if you, tra you if your particle traverses through the silicon uh, detectors you will uh, you will see uh, electron hole generation and which will produce you lot of uh, lot of charge output and that charge output gives you in the digitized form some hits here so you have several layers you have a several layers of hits here but this when your particle is produced in the center of the center of the detector your particle will 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 traverse through these detectors and give you you know curvature in the magnetic in the presence of magnetic field if we don't have the magnetic field the the tracker which is here will be very very large in the size actually reduce the size reduce the cost and also to get rid of the background you have the tracking very well done in this silicon actually this is the largest silicon tracker of that time which we used in the cms let me use other headphone also because i am not able to hear a few things from from our main controller <laughs> okay now it is fine okay so I can go this okay yes so maybe i start talking a few more things so <clears throat> we already talked about lhc what lhc is we collide protons okay so lhc is just giving us protons and colliding them for us but here at cms we are a big detector which we are recording these collisions so you can think it the the cms the detector as a big camera which is taking all the photographs of the collisions that are happening in large hadron collider and large hadron collider is smashing protons at a rate of 40 million per second okay so this camera has to be so fast that it takes these 40 million photographs every second so if we project to this screen you know you can access actually this screen from your computers typing lhc page one so this shows right now it's a proton physics the energy of the beam this is these are the two red color beams that use uh, red and blue color this the intensity of the beam each beam is not just one proton but it's a bunch of proton so 27 kilometers lhc is filled with about 2800 bunches of proton and each bunch carries about 250 billion proton okay so that's the intensity of each beam in each collision we are smashing 250 billion protons head on okay and each is you know then they are accelerated at an energy of 6.8 tv which you see in this black curve okay and this is beam is given to all the four experiments so now let's go to the cms experiment so what ashok told you showed you the uh, uh, the diagram of the cms experiment so because he was talking about the tracker so may i show you one of the you know zoomed and a small component of the tracking device so what you see here is the pixel detector or the pixel part detector of the experiment so you see this is one silicon pixel when a particle comes hit it gives ionizes this layer and it gives us the tar charge distribution which di is digitizes using this big uh, this you know small chips which we record we digitizes and convert into light and then we transfer using this optical fibers if you if you can see these are the optical fibers which are used to transfer the data from this to the readout system to our data acquisition this is the barrel a different geometry so the detector you know the cms detector is like a barrel like a cylinder like a cylinder and because it's a cylinder we need to close that cylinder from both the ends so we put detectors on both the ends of the the cylinder or the barrel which we call end caps because the barrel shape is different and end cap shape is different the detector needs to be made in different ways so what you see here if you see here the bottom part okay this is like a sector okay because we need to make a wheel out of it so it's a small sector and the same thing happens here you know the pixels are here now you can ask a question you know like what if a particle hits in this region we may lose that particle and we do not want any dead regions in our detector so what we do we put a pixel on the back side where we have electronics okay so we need electronics but we also do not want any dead region so we try to cover all the portion of the detectors you know all the dead regions by putting detectors there and we try to use as much space as we can okay and you can see these optical fibers which carry signals 
from the trackers. Likewise, these optical fibers are used in the entire CMS detector to carry signals, okay? Now, though it was not talked already, but at CMS experiment, we have two type of calorimeters. You all know calorimeter, right? The detectors that measures energy of the particles, okay? So we have two types of calorimeters, electromagnetic calorimeter to measure energy of the electromagnetic particles like electrons or photons or measure energy. And the other one is the hadronic calorimeter, measure energy of the hadrons, okay? So which is the, the electromagnetic calorimeter is a crystal calorimeter, okay? It's one of the very beautiful detectors that we have at CMS. It's just a crystal as clear as glass. So I can show you, this is how the real electromagnetic crystal look. It's a real one with a length of about 22 centimeters. Okay, it's as crystal as glass, but it's not a glass. It's a lead tongue state, okay? I cannot show you, but we have these two things to compare because one is glass and one is lead tongue state. Okay, they show you that both are as clear. What happens? The particle comes and hits from the surface of this cuboid, okay? It hits from the surface of this crystal and it produces a flash of light within the crystal. That we record using photo detectors. So we have photo detectors that record this light and then digitizes that light and send us as hits. And the, the fraction of the light produced is proportional to the energy recorded in the calorimeter, okay? So this is how we record energy in the experiment. Uh, so, and if we come to another part of the experiment, which are the muon detectors, because we have, the CMS detector is like an onion. It has different layers, okay? Different layers where each layer has different features. It helps detect different properties of different particles. Because different particles have different properties, we cannot have one big detector to record everything, okay? So we need to use different te detector technologies and different properties to detect different particles. What you see here, it's a drift tube chamber. So a muon, you know, you all get, I guess, no muons. Muons are heavier electrons with a mass of about 100 times that of an electron. It passes through this. These detectors are gaseous detectors. You see here, there's gas, there in the layer in the drift. When the muon passes, it ionizes the gas and drifts the electron hole pair towards the opposite polarity, which we record, okay? the gas. So, and what you see here now, yeah. Okay, and this is another version of a gaseous detector. You probably can see scale. It's really break, you know, really a big detector. If you make it stand, it's probably taller than me, okay? So this uh, is again a gaseous detector. It's a cathode strip chamber, okay? It's slightly different than what I showed you previously with uh, drift tubes, okay? It's also a gaseous detector, which works on a slightly different feature technology, okay? So we have this CSEs in the end cap region of the detectors and the drift tubes are in the barrel region of the detectors. So both are to detect muons, okay? But one can ask, why do we need two in two different part of the detector, okay? So the detector is such like, you know, the LHC is colliding like this. Let's assume this is the trans, the longitudinal direction. So the, the particles, because both are positive charge particles, they will try to repel or deviate. So if particles just deviate a little, they will go very, you know, close to the beam pipe or in the forward direction. The radiation dosage is very high, okay? So we want the, the detector in the end cap region or in the forward regions to be more radiation tolerant. Otherwise the detector will start losing its efficiency, right? Okay, so we want the detector in the end cam region to be more radiation tolerant. So that's why we use slightly different technology, like CSCs are more radiation tolerant. The electronics that we put is more radiation tolerant on these detectors in the end cap regions, okay? And this is, maybe I can show you how the end cap region of the detector look like. Uh, I talk to you like barrel, the center part is just like a barrel or a cylinder. And we close the barrel using this uh, end cap where we put it, you know, inside the detector like this and this region, you know, it's like, well, this lies what you see here. 
is what I was shown in the previous uh, shoot that we shown. Okay. So maybe we can go to Ashok and he can talk. And I, because I'm moving, I'm trying to show different things. I will move to the next region before Ashok can talk a few more things. Thank you, Varun. Thank you. Okay. We were already discussing a very interesting part and you have already seen a uh, real glimpse of these uh, sensors. So we were discussing the, the central part, which is made up of silicon sensors. You have seen those sensors, very nice, uh, you know, uh, clear sensor in the in the in the room you know this is a, this the, this is built of these sensors actually this is called the tracker and then as varun has shown you the crystals uh, so the crystals make us uh, made us our e uh, electromagnetic calorimeter this works on the principle of uh, uh, scintillation mechanism uh, most of the chemistry guys knows that we know the fluorescence and phosphorescence phenomena which works us uh, for the for producing the light output in the same wavelength region and then this phenomena enhances the light output also if you convert that light into electric signal you get the light output proportional to the energy of the particle so these are the crystals actually and then you have the hadron chlorimeter which is made up of a plastic scintillator now i'll reiterate that in india we make a uh, plastic scintillator modules which are not inside the uh, magnetic field but outside the magnetic field, something like here. So we have a, this, this layer is made, is called outer hadron chlorometer and Punjab University and Tata Institute has a, uh, actually uh, these modules are only fabricated in India. So Punjab University and TFR made all the, all the detector modules for the CMS. So this, this part and this part is made up of plastic scintillator. Uh, so again, scintillator gives you a light output, light output gives you, you know, a lot of uh, electric signal. Electric signal is proportional to the light, uh, to energy of the particles. So we measure the energy of the particles. In this case, we are measuring the energy of the electrons, uh, the photons, and in hadron chlorometer, we are measuring the energy of the hadrons. And now this is the magnetic field, 3.8 Tesla. Uh, and in this uh, magnetic field, this is a solenoidal magnetic field. So you, you remember that inside you have 3.8 Tesla, but outside you can have a two Tesla. And then if you go above this, uh, you have the muon chambers, which measure the muon. So after this part, uh, your detector will not give anything else than the muons and the neutrinos. <coughs> neutrinos we cannot measure. We can only measure the muons here. So we have the several layers of muon detectors here interleaved with the iron yoke, which helps us to smoothen our magnetic field. So these are the muon detectors. These are the chlorimeters, and then these are the trackers. And also on the picture, if you can see, uh, you have the you have the different parts of uh, the, the the detector shown in the in the very nice overall cylindrical view. But if this cutout is parallel part, and the part which is for the end cap is already shown in one of the <coughs> one of the small uh, small prototype module of the of the EK, uh, end cap, uh, which which uh, Varun has already shown you. So. Uh, so this is the complete okay. detector actually. Yes. Yes. Okay. So coming back to large hadron collider. So you may have seen in different photographs or different videos that <clears throat> this blue colored pipe that you see in the poster behind. So you may wonder what is inside this pipe. Okay. So when we try to, so here we have a real cut piece of that blue magnet. So inside we have two pipes which carries these bunches of protons in two directions, clockwise and counterclockwise, so that when they are moving, they do not interact with each other. And to keep them together in the pipe, we have different magnets. So we have a dipole magnet, we have a quadrupole magnet, and we have a sextopole magnet. So you can ask or wonder why we need magnets inside Large Hadron Collider. And these are really, really powerful magnets running at eight 0.3 Tesla. CMS magnet is 3.8 Tesla, which has a different functionality. Uh, we shall cover in slightly later moment. But for now, let me try to tell you that I told you we have 250 billion protons in a bunch, right? And all are positive charged particles. So if you think simple physics, you know, a basic, all these particles are trying to repel each other. So we want to keep them together in a bunch. So how do we keep them with some external force? And here we give external force using big, strong, powerful magnets. And we use quadrupole 
and sextopole magnet. So quadrupole and sex quadrupole magnet has four poles, two north and two south, and sextopole has six poles, three north and three south. So you can try to think that you know magnetic lines goes from north to south. So if you imagine like a cross, okay, it's like north, 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 south. So the lines goes like north to south, north to south, north to south, north to south, and inside you have a hole where you keep the beam focused. Okay, so that's what is done. We have magnets around the the beam pipe, and we keep the bunch together as narrow as possible. And sextopole is also doing the same thing, but they are called correcting magnets. So the quadrupole is like a coarse correction, and sextopole is like fine correction. Okay. So that's one of the important roles of the magnet and the dipoles we just have two poles north and south uh, is doing a different job for us so it's a circular collider right so circular accelerator so we want to bend the particle how do we do that so we you do that using dipoles so though we call this lhc as a circular collider but it's a circular accelerator but it's not circular in the sense that it's a polygon okay and by definition circle is nothing but polygon tending to infinity so this this lhc has about 1400 bends okay roughly of that order i may be somewhere you know here and there but that's what we have a straight section then a bend straight section and a bend okay and this bend is done by the dipoles okay so that's what we have here but that's the role of the cms uh, this uh, lhc magnets and these magnets are super conducting when we say super conducting uh, you know that super conductivity is a state where resistance is zero so that the current can flow okay so and to attain super conductivity we need to go to really really low temperatures which is why we have here 1.9 kelvin or minus 271 degree celsius it's getting noisy here so i let it go to ashok in the meanwhile i go to a different location where there is less noise okay okay now i am coming back to the screen basically i was talking about the indian contribution and uh, the first part i show is the outer hadron colorimeter uh, there are two layers in the uh, uh, ring zero of the barrel region there is one layer plus 1 and minus 1 uh, region and another layer in the 2 plus 2 and minus 2 uh, of the barrel region now in addition to this we have a uh, pre shower detector here and pre shower detector is consisting of uh, silicon sensors the 2 inch by 2 inch uh, sensors are being uh, prepared uh, actually fabricated in uh, bel uh, bengaluru <coughs> and uh, <coughs> these were fabricated between 2003 to 2005 and final integration happened in building 186 at cern and this project was delivered finally by by a couple of agencies including india the other part in 2000 uh, 2012 to 2014 uh, if i remember correctly we we have installed uh, the rpcs where barc and punjab university has a collaboration and they supplied uh, after fabrication and testing uh, the rpcs at punjab university chandigarh as well as at uh, at brc mumbai the the other part now we are since you know Uh, we are doing the upgrade of this experiment this means we are changing some components and also installing new components so in in collabor india cms collaboration is working for high granularity chlorimeter which will be in the end the end cap uh, in the end cap region of the cms and also uh, in addition to this we have a collaboration to work out the tracker modules in the in india where you know institutes like delhi university uh, nicer and other institutes are collaborating uh, sinp uh, tf uh, all 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 these institutes are working for for the silicon sensor upgrade for the hgcal as well as for the tracker now other thing is the the upgrade of the muon stations where we are working including the new technology which is called the gems so i am personally working for the gems here and doing the upgrade with my colleague joltan as well so we are working for upgrading the cms with a very very new and a fine technology they are, these are also radiation hard and going to be sitting in very very high radiation environment so these days we are actually the first station is already in 2019 where at delhi university we have at delhi university and punjab university we fabricated uh, gem detectors and splite and those detectors are already in and working for the um, outcome of the proton proton collisions warn to you okay thank you very much so 
now i am inside the area which is you know almost ready to go underground you may wonder why we are i'm wearing this helmet okay so it's very important for people to go when they go inside to take measure of all the safety things okay so right now i am wearing this dosimeter just to make sure that when we go underground we will be going at the same level where the experiment is which is about 100 meters underground so and there the space is not very much and there are a lot of equipment so we need to make sure nothing falls on our head or we are safe if anything falls okay so we'll be taking this elevator to go underground you may see right now it's sitting at about 97 meters and we have to wait a bit for the elevator to come up uh, in the meanwhile i can try to talk a few more things you know so i told you earlier that we have about 40 million collisions every second okay so each of this collision is what cms is trying to record cms is big camera which is recording but and i must tell you when we are we as cms is trying to record this collision the data for each of this collision okay is 2 megabyte so you all know right the size 2 megabyte if you know try to do the mathematics from 40 million collision per second to 2 megabyte per second you will have like petabyte of data every second so if you start taking photographs and recording all these photographs okay then we have petabyte of data every second we do not have that much storage uh, we cannot process that much uh, so we have you know i'll interrupt and we are in the elevator now ready to go underground uh, and you can see here it says zero zero meters and we will be going down very pretty fast okay it takes around 45 seconds or 46 seconds to go underground and probably the internet will go. So I will continue talking about trigger, you know, in a moment after probably in a minute or so. So over to you, Ashok. Thank you, Varun. Thank you. So uh, I guess if you have any questions uh, till now, you can ask right now. I can take a break for a moment. But if you don't, I will ask a question to you guys. The question is very simple. How do you know that we are going to collide with 70 EV? Why we need 70 EV? And it is from D. Broglie's hypothesis. It is very, very easy that you have a, a lambda cross which goes uh, proportional to H cross over P. Okay. So can you calculate if you have a lambda cross roughly say 3.5 into 10 to minus 4 for me? Just write down lambda cross is equal to lambda cross is equal to 3.5 into 10 minus 4 for me. Okay. Can you work out the energy needed to go or to probe this kind of dimensions? You will see that you will get 70 V as the answer. So if you try to probe inside the nucleus, you you need a uh, you need a Fermi dimensions, but if you want to go, you know, into the neutron and then more deep into it, then you need a more sub uh, sub part of the Fermi. So if you calculate, you know, it's very easy. H cross C, how much H cross C? So use the Planck's units. We don't use uh, uh, normal units as units. We use the Planck's units. We are your mass, your time. Uh, your uh, speed of light is one always. So your H cross C is 200 MeV for me. Okay. So lambda cross is equal to H cross C over PC. PC is energy. Ignore the rest mass energy. It is very, very small. 1 GeV for a, for a proton actually. We are trying to calculate for a proton. Proton is our main probe here. So H cross C is 200 MeV for me divided by PC you have to calculate. So you interchange PC with the lambda cross. So how much lambda cross I have given you? 3.5 into 10 minus 10 raised to power minus 4 for me. What is your answer? Okay. So maybe while the students are trying to think, okay. uh, do the mathematics, I can come back. So I was talking about we have two makeup. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me tell you, we are underground now we are about 88 meters okay so uh, 
this is pretty safe area in fact we tell all our visitors when we, they are here that this is one of the safest place to be because this is pressurized and it can these walls and doors are safe to keep things outside these doors okay these are really really big and heavy doors that we have which it's instructed to always keep them closed okay so okay now back to what i was talking about that in 40 million of collision we have 2 megabyte of data for each of these collision that means we have petabytes of data we cannot store all this we cannot send all the data so if you i can tell you try to relate you in the in a sense that you know in india we have 4g network at many places still not working everywhere and 4G network has a speed of about 30 megabyte per second on average. Okay, 30 to 50 megabyte per second. And, and I'm talking about petabyte per second. So, you know, even, <coughs> sorry, even with all the advances, we do not have data transfers at this high rate and we do not have storage for this. So we have to select some interesting events, okay? Interesting events, when I say interesting, it has to be interesting in terms of physics, like the questions that we want to answer, like data which can help us find dark matter, data which can help us discover something, some unknown forces, some help us find like supersymmetric particles or, you know, answers like why we have only one Higgs. So we want to have data which answers this question. So we have a trigger system at CMS, which is of two level, okay? At level one, we take, which is a custom processor boards, which are made up of digital devices known as FPGA, which is field gate programmable arrays. Uh, if you have not heard of this term called FPGA, these are special integrated chips that you also have in your phones and in your laptops, except that the one that we make here are really, really fast. So let's go inside. Uh, I think I can keep walking, talking and walk, and we do not, okay. So we are already sharing the two level of trigger system, uh, because. but I will take a short break from that topic and show you that, you know, we are underground and I asked my colleague Naomi to show you that we, if you can see these lights, you know, or, how they are going up or just to show you, we are really, really underground, okay? So we are about 25 stories underground, okay? And this is how we send data. This is just LED lights that we have for Diwali, okay? But uh, just to represent how we are sending data up, okay? So coming back to the topic of uh, trigger system. So these are digital devices, uh, integrated chips, which write very simple, very smart, and very fast algorithms. You, you know, everyone these days talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, but here at LHC, you know, at the CMS level one trigger, yes, we do artificial intelligence, machine learning, but at the trigger system, we cannot do all these things, okay? Because the reason being, we have just 3.6 microsecond to make a decision, you know, micro is 10 to power minus six. So it's like microsecond of a time to make a decision. You, that's just not enough to complicate things. So we have to be really, really quick, really, really simple, really, really fast. Okay. So that's what we do. And in 3.6 seconds, 3.6 millisecond, microsecond, we select 100,000, which is like 1 lakh out of 40 million. Okay. That we select in 3.6 seconds. And the second layer, which we call the high level trigger, where we have about millisecond worth of time, uh, we reduce even further to about 1,000 events per second. Okay. So we reduce from 40 million to 1,000 per second. That's our data taking rate. And you can imagine now we are just storing 1,000 and 2 megabyte per second. So it's about 2 GB per second. That's what we are sending. Okay, so let's go inside what we call counting room because what I told you involved a lot of numbers, right? So we are doing counting, except that I am doing it for you or these are the big computers or big trigger boards that are doing counting for us, okay? Now we are in a room 
which has several services. And if you especially see here, you know, <clears throat> you have this cyan color, we can go inside actually. So, So these are some of the VME racks. I think these are tracker feds that, that are taking data from underground and sending it to the DAC system. But before the data is sent to the DAC, we need the permission of the trigger system, okay? And unfortunately, or fortunately, the trigger does not take input from tracker, okay? Why? Because the tracker has millions of channels, okay? There are millions of channels in the tracker. And as I told you, we just have 3.6 microsecond, okay? So we cannot correlate these millions of channels. So we only have at the trigger level calorimeter data that is electromagnetic calorimeter, hadronic calorimeter, and the muon system, which Ashok pointed out are the biggest portion of the CMS detector and lie on the outside, okay? They are also very fast detectors. So for triggering in, in muons, we have special detectors, not DTs, not CSEs. We have resistive plate chambers, RPCs, just for triggerings. These are again also gas detectors, but really, really fast. So what do you see here, okay? These are some of the boards, trigger boards, which have FPGA, and you see this blue or cyan color green fibers. These are optical fibers. And these are optical fibers running at about 10 gigabit per second, okay? So these are really, really fast optical fibers that are running. And right now we are trying to upgrade even those so that they run at about 25 gigabit per second, okay? But that's something for 2030. So probably eight years down the line, okay? So this is what you see here are mostly trigger and once the trigger says okay every, this data looks interesting this is good we take this data and these are some of the computers that we have for the dac okay that's processing data and these are some of the the high voltage power supplies because running data requires a lot of power supplies some are high voltages some are low voltages Okay, so this is what they are. And in general, we do not allow visitors to be here because it can be really, really dangerous, okay? So you can see a mess of cables. So one has to be really, really careful to work with all those things, okay? So you can also imagine, you know, if you are confused, what is a trigger? To think it like when you go on a vacation, you click, hundreds of photographs, right? Thousands of photographs. But not all the photographs are good and you do not have that much memory in your phones as well, right? So you want to select some good ones. So when you are going back from the location to your hotel, in the bus, you delete about 10 photographs because you have less time, right? And But when you go home, you have more time. So then that you can think of as a second level where you delete probably 100 more photographs out of the thousand. So, and over the period of time, <clears throat> when you have leisure time, somehow you are deleting one or two or three. So that's what we are doing here. You know, once we, the event has passed the trigger and we are doing the data analysis, the data analysis can take about two years or three years to just to figure out that what physics we can extract from the data that we have collected from the triggers, okay? So I give now the mic to Ashok and Thank I you. go even a level down before uh, and show you the effect of magnet. Thank you. Thank you, Varun. Uh, interesting thing. If you want to see a small glimpse, just go to a nearby telephone exchange and see a one rack, you know, communicating with the, with the nearby town uh, telephones. So uh, the thing is that uh, we have, you know, why we are talking about triggers and why we are talking about such a you know big collision energies and i hope that you have got the right answer 70 we are nearby so by the way so this is the collision point and you know after the collision point by by applying e is equal to mc square out of the energy you create the mass mass is the first thing we try to see in in any particular in particular collision so mass of what for example higgs higgs and any any new particles will be just 
just produce here actually and immediately they will decay when they will decay to a visible particles what are the visible particles for detector electrons photons uh, hadrons or muons okay we cannot see neutrinos here in fact for us neutrinos are missing transverse energies and we calculate by simple kinematical calculation so okay here within the small micron level dimensions we just try to you know create the particles and immediately they decay so what, whatever particle you think in this world the new particle it will decay immediately to electrons or muons or hadrons or you know only these uh, few uh, the, a few uh, kind of particles so even if you say of our supersymmetry or dark uh, matter uh, composites everything will be decayed to these uh, couple of particles so that's why we need tracker to measure the momenta of the particles we need the uh, calorimeter to okay i am not able to move the screen I'll just wait uh, i want to see the the slice of the okay sorry okay so for example here is a very nice slice of the so here the the the, the collisions are happening and then after the collision the charged particle will make a, as i have shown you that uh, in in the, the the real silicon tracker and you know the you can see the, the the curvature and curvature will give you the momentum from the from the equation we were discussing earlier and then the neutral particles like photons and neutral hadrons will immediately go to electromagnetic calorimeter or hadron calorimeter and deposit all the energy and the muons will pass through and will be measured in the muon stations so basically if you if you can detect all these particles precisely you can detect the new state like a higgs particle you discovered through the decays of electrons or muons or photons so these were the discovery uh, final topologies either higgs decays to electrons or muons or either higgs decays to photons so that's why the construction of these calorimeters to 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 see the photons inside the detector or to see the jets or hadrons inside the hadron calorimeter or see the muons in the final uh, muon stations is important that's why any new particle in particle physics is discovered through the particle collisions in this way so the onion based four uh, you know four pi detector is made to cover all the most of the regions and then try to discover the new state okay so yes. maybe i take over from here again so now we are almost you know underground in the you know just standing next to the detector except that there is a big concrete wall separating us so if you can see here you know it's a big post though it's a poster not a real lhc because right now we are having i showed you in the screen above that we have protons in the beam so we cannot be inside though the protons you know are focused using the magnets in principle it should not come out but it's all just for the safety in case of any accident any leakage it can harm human life okay so no one is ever allowed even the biggest you know the most powerful person on probably on the in the country is not allowed to enter large hadron collider when it's on okay <clears throat> so that's what it's large hadron collider is for you so if i show you behind in different photographs so this is a bottle of hydrogen gas okay this is literally this big bottle of hydrogen gas from where we extract protons so it's like we strip off the electrons we pass the <clears throat> protons using this path to this linear accelerator so you may try to recall the vi short video that we showed on the surface with about probably 40 minutes back so this is a linear accelerator so lhc is not about just one big accelerator so if we can focus on this you know poster so it's a chain of accelerator that we have at CERN. So we start from protons. We excel, and also if remember, try to remember that we have bunches of proton, and each bunch has two fifty billion protons. Okay, on uh, so we need to do this bunching together to keep them protons together. So and also the incre in, also to increase the energy of the proton. So there is a chain of accelerator. We start from a linear accelerator, which is called LINAC. Then it goes to a small circular accelerator, just about 150 meters, which is the booster. Then it goes to a slightly bigger circular accelerator, the proton synchrotron. 
and then the proton go on to the bigger you know sps which is super proton synchrotron which is 7 kilometers and finally it goes to lhc which is 27 kilometers so if we come down you know on this table you see at each level of different acceleration there is increase in the speed of the particles so you may see that even at the proton synchrotron level the energy is already traveling with speed of light this is c is here is the fraction of the uh, speed of light and what you see here is the increase in the energy of the proton at each level okay so it's like a stepwise operation where increase the speed and energy of the particles are increased okay and though we no one can see the protons or the bunches but they look like a pencil okay they are really narrow you know you can see the two pipes where the protons are coming and going in this direction so they are just like you know almost like a pencil about 10 to 12 centimeter long and less than one centimeter in diameter you can try to think it of that and we are crossing two pencils or bunches when we are colliding so we are not really colliding them like head on but we are crossing like a cross okay because if you make them collide head on they will go into each other and then we will have collision everywhere in lhc but what we want we just want collision at one point where we have our big detectors so we steer them, we bend them. So when they are actually coming, they are coming in the same pipe, okay? We steer them, we bend them, we cross them, and then we send them to back again to other pipe. So that's why it can be a continuous operation. And when there is collision, there can be collision for about 15 hours continuously on average, okay? So one beam can last for 15 hours. In fact, this year we managed to achieve for about 60 hours when LHC did record, though it was not the highest energy, but still running 60 hours consecutively was a big achievement. So now very close coming to this door, you know, if we need to enter the experimental cavern where we have our beautiful detector sitting, uh, we need to enter to this door and do our eye scan using that machine. But right now, because the magnet is on, and we have collisions happening again it says close entry not allowed you know so we cannot take you inside virtually as well even because we love our lives and we do not want to go inside with the beams inside okay so we will just show you here but one important aspect we can show you that i told you we have about seven meters of concrete wall that's separating the big hall and where i am currently it's the same level okay but and this wall is thick enough to keep the radiation inside, okay? But one thing that it cannot keep inside is the magnetic field. We have a very big magnet. It's a 3.8 Tesla. Half the magnet what LHC is, but it's the largest magnet in the world, okay, in terms of size and also in terms of the energy it stores. So this magnet is a solenoidal shape. You can imagine this solenoid as a circle is a cylinder again okay and if you know that like i told you in north and south pole the magnetic lines goes from north to south but in a solenoid the field lines the magnetic field lines goes from like outside to inside they are oscill rotating around the solenoid from outside to inside and you know? they cl close a loop magnetic lines always close the loop okay so that's what is happening here. So the field inside is uniform and outside it's, it decreases at is, as the, we are going away from the magnetic field, magnet, okay? So it's decreasing. So even within the detector outside the magnet, it's about half and it start to decrease, but it's still, still very strong that we can see. So if you see, I have these paper clips, you know, just the paper clips that you use to bind your papers or keep things together. So right now, if you see, it's really straight, okay? If I leave it from the bottom, you can see it's getting attracted towards the wall, okay? So you can see the magnet effect is there. And even if I leave it, okay, let's, let me try to take it in this direction. It will come back, okay? And in fact, if you see, it, I can even try to hang it there. You know, this is not a magnet, just a paper clip, and these are normal pipes. If I hang it, it works even like it, okay? 
so this is just to show you this how strong the the magnet is and i should actually if you were here i would have asked you why what what do you think the difference between the magnet we have in lhc and what's the difference and cms or at the first place why we need a magnet you know if you see why do we th need a magnet in lhc oh in cms sorry why do it in lhc i told why we need a magnet we need the magnet to keep the protons together to bend the protons but why we need a magnet in cms i mean you have detectors taking data that's it we don't need a magnet but no we need a magnet so as it was told right that we have these calorimeters measuring energies so but we also need to know the mass of the particles right so how do we know that for mass we need energy and momentum so for momentum we need the direction right so to get the direction we get the direction using the magnets because magnet bends the particle another very important aspect what's the motivation to have detectors to identify different particles how do we identify different particles we use different det det detectors to identify different properties now one very important property of any particle is an electric charge right there are positive charge particle negative charge particle and neutral charge particle so how do we identify them with a magnet okay magnetic field will bend positive in one direction negative in one direction and the neutral will just go straight right so we have distinguished at least at one scale three different particles now we can try to add calorimeter information whether this charge particle deposited energy in an electromagnetic calorimeter or a hadronic calorimeter if it deposited in an electromagnetic calorimeter it can either be a photon if it's neutral if it bent it can be a positron or an electron and if it just passed the electromagnetic and deposited in the hadron it can be mesons or kaons or you know that requires a lot of different studies to make sure and as ashok told you that we do not directly find new particles okay like higgs boson you cannot directly detect it in one detector so these all the new particles or probably if we ever find dark matter particles they are produced for a very short period of time and then they decay to standard model standard model particles so here we live with an assumption that all the new particles somehow interact with the standard model particles or the fundamental particles that exist in nature that we know of if they do not interact them with them we probably will never be able to identify them because our knowledge our expertise have some certain limitations and we have to live up with within those limitations okay and do try to do our best that we can do okay so maybe i go back to ashok and i try to go back to the control room if we still have few more moments left thank you thank you in the meanwhile do we have any questions from any student or the audience i can see you students please ask the questions you should be readily asking the questions okay if not then i will continue so since in your masters or in bachelors when you study uh, uh chemistry or physics you learn about the different uh, mechanisms for example we were discussing how to discover these particles one of the mechanism we discussed about the scintillators where we try to uh you know <clears throat> use of the phosphorescence or fluorescence phenomena to get uh, light output from the particle energies the second thing is the is the in for example in the semiconductor thing which we have already discussed that the particle interaction created lot of electron hole pairs which creates the analog signal and you convert to the digital signal and then to the light output to tra traverse through the fibers as fast as uh, possible and then in the in the in the last part of the cms detector we have the outermost part of the detector we have the gaseous detector so gaseous detectors if you if some of the master students have worked out in the giger muller counters or ionization counters and if you have not then you probably visit your nearby department of physics and uh, punjab university and you can really get a glimpse of these things you can get a glimpse of the sodium iodide scintillator and the related data acquisition we use so sodium iodide crystal 
is one of the starting class of the crystals we use for the nuclear and particle physics experiments. The other class were the BGU crystals used in elsewhere. And then we have the lead tungsten crystals, which are now used in ALICE and the CMS sector to large hadron collider. The concept is same, the efficiency and the resolution varies. The, the last part, which I'm going to discuss is the Giger Muller counters or ionization counters, bursts on the phenomena of particle interacting inside the gas and creates the ionization. And that ionization is collected through the, through the charge output and charge output is again converted in the, on the similar uh, basis as we have done for the for the tracker. Actually, the muon stations here are also tracker for the muon. We call it as the outer tracker of the CMS, and this is called the inner tracker of the CMS actually. So outer tracker means the muon tracking actually. So you convert the charge output of the ionization to the to the uh, to the to the to the distal signal, and then you process the distal, distal signal through fiber output to the back end. To, to to see the uh, to the signal as fast as possible now since varun was talking about the three uh, you know 3.5 microsecond limit to record the data or the select the data now we are going to upgrade the detector and this latency is going to be increased to 12.5 microsecond in the same phenomena as we are not using the the trigger concept that quick uh, you know uh, information from the tracker earlier in the upgrade we are trying to uh, uh, use this information from the tracker with the upgraded tracker and here we will have the template based phenomena to select the triggers from using the tracker as well. So upgrade of the CMS will give a new picture to the CMS and this will enhance the data uh, quality, the data efficiency and the physics output of the full experiment. Oh, we are in the control room. Varun to you. Oh, we are losing Varun because of the, uh, no. So we have the Wi-Fi problem there, maybe. I cannot hear them. Okay. Can you? Yeah, okay. Varun okay, so, okay, sorry. Yeah, so we are back up on the surface, okay? So we will, now you see I'm wearing masks because it's still mandatory to wear masks when we go to control room. Uh, we are few, about 10 meters still away from control room, but on the way to control room, we have a model of CMS detector. So maybe I should stand this direction, okay? So you said this is how the CMS look like, okay? It's a big detector. In length, it's 21 meters. The diameter is about 15 meters and the weight is about 14,000 tons, okay? So this is how, if you see in the vid, in this light, this is how the, you know, the, the proton beam comes and then you have collision at the center because the beam is coming from both the direction, okay? And then this is how the different layers of the detector look like. So we have detectors in the barrel and end cap. As I told earlier that we need slightly different detectors in barrel and end cap. So this is the inner disk of the tracker layer. And then this is <clears throat> in the end cap region, okay? This is the tracking things. Now, this is the tracker. I'll just outside the tracker is the electromagnetic calorimeter, which is made up of lead and tungstate crystals. This is in the barrel, and then this is in the end cap. The light is faint, but you may be able to see, okay, flashing something. Then this is the hadronic calorimeter, which is made up of, it's a heterogeneous calorimeter made up of brass and iron as passive layer, and the active layer is, is plastic scintillator, as it was told by Ashok, which records the light, okay? This is the, in the barrel region, and this is in the end cap region. And not just is this, but we also have detectors put in the very forward region for particles traveling very close to the beam pipe because we do not want any particle to lose, to leave the detector undetected. So we have put detector almost at every angle, you know, and every place that we really get each and everything. And then what you see here is the muon detector. So the red color is just the steel support system and between the red layers is the muon gaseous detectors, okay? This is the barrel part and this is the end cap part. So this is the drift tubes and this is the cathode strip chambers. And this is the solenoid, CMS solenoid magnet sitting somewhere in the middle of the detector, okay? So we can try to show you how different particles also, when they, like when the collision happen, we produce different particles. So if you, See, I don't know if you can see, 
but there is like two particles produced in an event so you can see like suppose these two particles are coming in one collision they are depositing energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter one is going straight and one is bending so we can say one is probably a photon and one is an electron or a or a positron and same like if you see these are hadrons depositing energy in the hadronic calorimeter one being charged and one neutral and this you see a particle traveling a long distance which is a muon because you may have studied that muon ionizes less we also call it is like a minimum ionizing particle and but you see a strange thing happening you know it's bending in two direction so if you try to recall this is the solenoid okay so the magnetic lines are going from outside to inside so the direction of the magnetic field inside is in one direction and outside is in the opposite direction <coughs> so it's acting differently for both for the same charged particle so it's bending it's a simple physics that you study in your 12th standard you don't even need to study bsc or msc for that okay so now we are ready to go inside the control room <coughs> so control room is a place because these are really, really big machines these big equipments we always need people to control the system to turn it on to you know when we are taking data the data quality how it is we need to make sure that the data quality is good all the detectors are working and when we are sending data the data should be continuously flowing because if it's blocked somewhere in between we are probably losing a very important physics data so i'll try to look talk less here because people are working but we can just i'll stay quiet for about 30 seconds and we can just show you how the i can i can talk works. if you wish just uh, sure, give sure. the arrows so go to the first of all the main uh, shift leader just a, a little bit of sign which controls the cms operation uh, there and then in the yeah shift uh, shift leader and then uh, yeah shift leader is the main uh, controlling person here who is controlling the operations for the for the cms and in the back of the cms we have the data acquisition uh, uh, shift leader who is the second to the to the shift leader but it is important because acquisition of the data efficiency and you know uh, the the quality of the data depends how much uh, our deck shifter was efficient during the night or the day and then we have the trigger shifter in between both of them uh which works for uh, you know some time changing the menu of the data taking uh and also see how how good uh, the trigger is working and then you can uh, give a give a glimpse of the uh, of the uh, the sh technical shifter which controls actually the the main you know technical part of the cms it has the many windows many many things he's seeing uh, in the in the, in the in the in the same time but it is very important because we are controlling we the detector is operational through may, various services you have a gas you have a, you have a you have a temperature monitoring you have a cooling going down you have a high voltage low voltage so everything you know you have to monitor through various sensors also so this technical shifter has a responsibility to see the operation technically and this is very very important but all of them are very important but you understood and understand you know kind of uh, uh, things uh, there now you see the coil current there 18164 ampere for producing 3.8 tesla magnetic field think of a superconducting uh, magnets and the current they are carrying right now and the cryogenics is at you know few kelvin 1.8 kelvin or so so you can think of uh, cryogenics we use there to cool the system using the liquid uh, helium now you can speak varun you are outside the control room as okay. well okay so yeah so shashok already talked about different shifters you know so like shift leader we also call as like the captain of the ship because he is all responsible for all the operations maybe i can take you the my the mask off because i am outside the control room now so <clears throat> slightly better to talk you know <laughs> the shift leader is you know like the uh, the the captain of the shift and the trigger shifter has a very important role you know i talked told you like we need to select good physics so i must tell you we have roughly around 500 algorithms running in parallel okay to select good physics data so when these we say 500 algorithms they are really really physics motivated okay different for different physics channel so we need to make sure that we keep a fraction of data 
for what measurements have already been done in previous generation experiments, what we also call standard model physics, because we should be able to, first of all, reproduce those results, okay? It's like a validation for our experiment that before discovering new thing, we should be able to identify and validate our own results. So Trigger is running all those things, you know, many algorithms in parallel, maintaining the data taking rate. And uh, the DAC shifter, as, so I'll keep moving probably, and the DAC shifter, so this is basically from where we are exiting is actually the entrance of our CMS control room where, you know, if you've ever come to CMS, this is where we badge. This is my son ID, you know, we badge it here, open the door and we go inside. Probably one of your professors, Antapreet Kaur has been here many times taking some of the shifts. So we go, it is a very beautiful location, you know, you can not just the physics motivation, you need to be here. We also have a beautiful location. It's cloudy here today, but uh, still. So coming back to the DAC, so DAC has an important role that to make sure that the event that are being triggered by the trigger system are successfully sent to the storage elements, because if they are not stored successfully, then whatever efforts have been gone to make the detector, the build the detector and run the detector are going in vain. So we need to be sure in each and every aspect of the detector that the detector is working fine and we are storing and sending data to, this, to the storage element. So I'll walk back. And in the meantime, maybe Ashok can talk. And okay. I think we are all we are going at the to end yeah. of visit as well. Yeah. So. We are welcoming back uh, Varun and Noami here. So okay, it will be we will be very happy. We it will it was just <clears throat> one uh, one way tunnel uh, conversation. Now your students should ask questions because we should also be knowing that how how good this visit was. And uh, the students who will be asking questions, Antapreet will offer chocolates from our behalf. Good one by one. Sir. Yes. So my question is, what is the temperament we should pursue in order to uh, pursue such a research? A temperament we should cultivate within ourselves. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is very, very generic to any research you continue. The first thing is the patience. Because research needs a lot of patience in, in a human. Otherwise, many people quit after a year or so. So uh, it is very important that the patience should be there. The other thing is to, uh, the long longevity to work for a long. The hard working and sincerity is also needed. But the first thing is the patience, which I learned from my experience. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you, sir. And also... Varun is trying Good to adjust his mic. Sir. Yeah, please ask the question. I'm Anuradha from my Master of Physics and my question is, are there more particles to find? Okay, for the moment, uh, Varun, you want to answer? answer? Yes, please, actually, please. I wanted to answer in a very simple way. You know, we all know there are at least four fundamental forces, right? Glu uh, the strong force, which is carried by gluons, right? The, electro -weak, the electromagnetic force carried by photons weak force carried by W and Z bosons and one force which all of us have experienced for the longest period of time probably is the gravitation. We all are standing because of gravitation, right? And what we have seen that each force is carried by some particle. But unfortunately, if we go by the analogy that each force is carried by some particle, gravitation should also be carried by some particle. And we have not seen that particle after running experiments across the globe, across generations, uh, people tend to call that particle graviton. Okay, you may have heard of that term graviton, but we have not find. So, you know, that can be one of the particle you should be looking for. And we also know about dark matter. If we believe the astronomical observations are correct, there is a lot of space which is filled with matter which we do not see and we tend to call it dark matter. Okay. And we like for matter, we know there are a lot of particles, right? Electrons or all the matter particle that we see, we call them matter particle. Uh, and the same way, 
the matter that we do not see should also have some particles. So those particles are yet to be discovered. We try to call them dark matter particles. So yeah, there is a lot to be discovered. Yeah. Hope uh, we answers your question. Okay. Next question, please. Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Manju. And okay. I want to ask you, why, why do we only prefer proton-proton collision for the experiment? Okay. So, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, you have to create energy to, to, to get the mass of, you know, the particle you want to search. Okay. Now, uh, the possibility is that you can collide uh, electron and positron and create this particle. But it, first of all, you need need to know what kind of particle you want to discover. Now, if you if you are not sure, then what you will do? You will try to have a you know collisions of many particles together. In protons, we have quarks up, up, down, and in other proton also up, up, down. But not only up, up, down. You create you have the gluons, and gluons can create other kind of quarks as well. So this means you are colliding many many particles in one way. And many, many interactions will produce, certainly produce more probability for having a new particle. When you are colliding an electron, it is a single interaction. When you are colliding a proton with a proton, you are creating lot of interactions. And out of those lot of interactions, you have lot of uh, possibility to create the particle. It is called as the cross-section of the production of the particle. So if you calculate the cross-section, for the particle production according to PP collisions or E, e minus E plus or E minus uh, something else, you will calculate the cross section is more for the proton proton collision and less for the electron and positron. You want to add, Varun? Yeah, so yeah, I'll just say a few more things similar to what already told. So the question is, you know, why protons? So, you know, you got, you, prepare, you students, all the students are studying particle physics, right? So, prob hopefully, uh, you know, the master student. So, you know, there's for, in general also, for anything to happen, there is a probability, okay? Like, let's assume that electrons will collide and there's a probability it will produce two particles, two electrons probably, or two quarks, okay? There's each process that can happen because there are different interaction or in a in a different way, let's assume that you are, you know, a class of 50 people. You have different groups, right? There is a probability that you talk to one of your friend more. There is a probability that you talk to another friend of yours less, right? Because you like some people more, some people less. So same people, same way, some particle like the other particle more, the you know, and few other particle less. So this, this we term in terms of probability, okay? So the probability of a process to happen, how we know that this is the probability? This we know from the experiments that have already been taken place, okay? And from the previous generation, taking help from the knowledge we have acquired over the generation, we know that when we collide electron, we are just colliding one particle. An electron can produce other particle with less probability, okay? Uh, but when we collide proton, proton, have valence quarks which is just three quarks two up and a down quark but they also have a sea of quarks which are in a very small fraction okay so when we are colliding these protons okay when we are colliding these protons we are not just colliding valence quarks yes there are more possibility that it just the valence quarks colliding it can be like up colliding with a down or a down colliding with up two up colliding or there also we have the anti quarks okay it can be a quark colliding with anti quark quark colliding with a gluon, a gluon colliding. So there are many different permutation combinations that can happen in a collision, okay? And then you can produce a variety of particles which can help us discover something new if there is something new or nothing. So for this reason also, when we collide proton, we also call the proton colliders as discovery machines or dirty machines because a lot of, we are colliding a lot of mess, okay? But for electrons, they are also called precision machines or clean machines because they are so clean. It's just electrons and you and electrons we know are also fundamental particle. We cannot even break them if we believe as of today. Okay, but for protons, 
they are not fundamental particle so that's one of them because we are trying to discover new things so we want to collide protons a very good uh, question manju thank you very much uh, and you have another question as well yes sir ah uh, please sir uh, sir told us about uh, the trigger system which selects only some special data so what happens to the other data does it get deleted for ever it's forever it's gone it's gone it's like your photos you deleted we don't even have a trash that that can save for 30 days so that's why it's a very important aspect of the cms or any big experiment which has a trigger system that you want to be sure that you are selecting and yes this again boils down to the probability there is probability that we may miss some important events but we should not be missing all of those we should select a few of those but before yeah so before uh, doing the actual trigger selections varun and their team does a lot of homework it is not very easy to throw out the garbage so if there is a lot of hard we goes by the team actually a very nice question as well uh, manju uh, you have more question as well no sir thank you sir oh very nice questions this means they were following us <laughs> more questions from students or the audience yeah please from so my name is khushi Uh, so my question is uh, is the how the calorimeters are placed uh, is there any order or pattern or something yeah yeah so the center is a tracker so charge particle make the tracker but uh, you will keep the material budget less so that you know you you are not stopping the electrons or photons earlier than you measure the energy so tracker has a very very small material budget they are very very thin actually the sensor that detect you have seen the sensor actually he was showing it is very very thin so material budget is very very less so that there is a still a chance that they can deposit energy in the calorimeter so arrangement is such that your tracker uh, doesn't uh, you know stop the particle completely but it stops in the in the in the electromagnetic calorimeter for the electrons and photons and as soon as electrons and uh, photons are stopped there is uh, the second layer of the particles the hadrons are stopped by hadron calorimeter so in a way in calorimetry we call them as the interaction lens so the interaction length of the the, the tracker is very well very, very very less oh i am losing okay so it is very very less it is i think less than 2 lambda or so 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 then you have the uh, electromagnetic ma calorimeter where the interaction lengths are such that you can measure the electrons and photons and for the hadrons the the radiation you know uh, the interaction lengths are divided such that your uh, your electromagnetic component is is equally you know giving a, a hadronic uh, a particle to uh, uh, deposit the energy in the hadron calorimeter so there are detailed studies be says us you know uh that your tracker will not uh, actually stop the energy of the particle completely but it will give a chance to give it a detection in the electromagnetic calorimeter and for the hadrons in the hadron calorimeter actually uh, so i would like to add small two small things about that so yeah that's also a very good question i it's just because we did not cover this due to shortage of time so that's it's very important to know where your detector is placed and you know the tracker as told needs to be such that you know it takes the smallest possible fraction of energy of the particles and still give you ionizes the layer of the tracker or the the pixel and give you the coordinates because it gives x y coordinate and then you have multiple layers so that helps give you the z coordinates okay but the calorimeters you know they the very important property of any calorimeter you know be it electromagnetic or hadronic calorimeter is that you want to make the particle die within the calorimeter the particle should not be able to evade the calorimeter you know it should be made such so each calorimeter has as a length which we call a interaction length or a radiation length based you know that is the length in which the particle will should be stopped within the calorimeter okay for electromagnetic calorimeter that's about you know we have this 22 cm uh, cm crystal which is well within the half the you know almost the double the length of radiation like interaction length for lead tungstate and it stops even the most energetic electron or a photon within the calorimeter okay good question but yeah, yeah.
So, sir, I think we are done with the question answer round. Okay, thank you. We found the students were very, very smart to ask these questions, and we are happy that you know, uh, although we were incomplete in a uh, few topics but then they try to come you know make the knowledge so complete that you know by asking and answering up from ourselves we are able to you know uh give the full knowledge of the chlorometry as well uh i think joltan noami you want to come here as well because at least they can see you yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, we two were just you know in front of camera but uh, everything is managed by the two experts joltan and uh, yeah, and Noami, and uh, they are from Sun, and uh, all these things. Not only these things; these are just uh, you know small things with, the, with which they are doing, but they are also doing the uh, real stuff for the detector as well as for the fix. Yeah. But indeed, we work together. Yeah, and indeed we work together for the for the gem activity we are doing. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Antarpreet. It was very nice uh, from your behalf as well. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, on behalf of our worthy principal, Professor Angita Kaushal, Professor Anju Sharma, Head of Physics Department, faculty members and students, I, Dr. Mandeep Kaur, convey deep regards and hearty thanks to Dr. Ashok Kumar and Dr. Varun Sharma to enlighten the knowledge of our students. It was really a good and very unique experience for our students to visit the CMS lab virtually. And special thank thanks to CMS technical team. Really, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are honored. Well, bye. Bye.